I have to say that I've never mutton busted, but I have witnessed it several times and it must be exhilarating. In the contest that I've seen, I think the kid gets something like 20 bucks. So it's really not about the money. It's definitely about the ride and the relationships between the buster and the mutton and from one buster to another. We believe that us humans are hardwired for heightened experiences, relationships, seeking something greater than ourselves. Some bust muttons, we're architects. Hey, my name is Brandon Dake, and I'm Zoom conferencing with my partner, Andrew Wells, as we social distance during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we started Dake Wells Architecture in 2004 in Springfield, Missouri, which is represented by the bottom red dot on this map. We also have an office in Kansas City, which is located about two and a half hours northwest of Springfield. Now, we consider ourselves one studio in two locations, and although the two cities are very different, our two studios work very collaborative and exist to challenge the status quo and elevate the design experience throughout the Midwest. From the beginning of our practice, well, from the beginning, our practice has relied on a collective curiosity and individual humility. We focus on the power of the collective, surrounding ourselves with people motivated by the same thing that Andrew and I are, which is doing the best work we can muster. This reliance on coll collaborative thinking and digging deep to find solutions is what drives our culture. So Brandon and I both grew up along Route 66, about 40 miles apart, neither one of us aware of each other's existence, but we found that we both shared a love of baseball and Looney Tunes cartoons. Only Route 66 could link Brandon's hometown of Cuba, Missouri with mine and Devil's Elbow, and that ultimately led us to Springfield. The Big Piney Bridge at Devil's Elbow represents the kind of utilitarian but expressive structures that tends to inspire us. Likewise, the giant hillbilly sign at Sterling's along Route 66 communicates a sort of quirky, graphic, iconic, and colorful quality that we think makes people smile. That inspires us too. Growing up a hillbilly meant an appreciation for hard work, making something out of nothing, and appreciating life. A reliance on ingenuity over innovation has informed our practice from the very beginning, making the most out of the things that are available to us. This picture on the left is uh, my distant cousin, Clarence Wells, making a basket from a white oak tree in 1940, somewhere close to Devil's Elbow. Rooted in pragmatism and equipped with an understanding of the material's capabilities, mixed with pride in his craft, the results are poetic in their execution. These are the underlying values of our practice. Growing up, my dad had this old 1967 Chevy and an old beat up tractor. And when something needed fixed, he would go out in the tool shed, pull out a handful of items and fix it himself. I grew up thinking that my dad could fix anything with some duct tape, some baling twine and pliers. When he was finished, it may not have looked pretty, but it worked. And I learned the craft of ingenuity at a very early age. This notion of, of making something from nothing has stayed with me into adulthood. This has influenced the way we practice architecture. It's the idea of taking normal everyday elements and assembling them in a new way. The idea of taking the ordinary and making something extraordinary. We joke in the office that it's like trying to build Frankenstein. The parts and the pieces are nothing special, but when we assemble them a new way, and we add a spark of creativity, it can bring new life into existence. A perfect example of this was a project we did in Exeter, Missouri. Exeter is a small farming town in Southwest Missouri with a population of 707. The school district had three requests, a new practice gym, a cafeteria, and a performing arts space, but they only had a budget of 2.2 million to spend. Now, their existing school was a hodgepodge of metal buildings pieced together over the years, and in the middle was a courtyard, and after careful study of the campus, we decided that this courtyard was the best location for a new addition. With the limited budget, we knew the school could not afford all three, a new gym, a new cafeteria, and a new performing arts space. So we wondered if we could design one space that could function as all three. Now, the biggest challenge in pulling this off was going to be the acoustics. If you've ever been in a gym with stage on the side, you've probably noticed how poor the acoustics are when someone is speaking, and usually the reverberation is so bad you can hardly hear what the person is saying. So we figured if we could solve the acoustics problem, we could successfully turn a practice gym into a performing arts space. 
Through our design exploration, we created a folded wood ceiling that bounced sound into this sweet spot right in front of the stage. And if that sound escaped that sweet spot, it would get absorbed by the walls and the ceiling and not re reverberate. The end result was a space large enough to practice basketball in. It had a rubberized athletic floor that could be cleaned for school lunches. And it had an acoustically tuned ceiling designed specifically for performing arts. The design was pretty simple. I mean, we installed tectum across the walls and down, this, uh, uh, down the walls and across the ceiling. Uh, due to its durable and acoustic qualities, we wrapped this tectum over a very simple structural frame and bookended it with large panels of glass to maximize daylight. Then we inserted this wood wrapper to fine tune the acoustics and conceptually we likened it to a sushi roll. There's this absorptive white layer that soaks up all the soy sauce on the outside and then this internal wrapper that holds all the good stuff in. On the left you can see the overhead coiling door beyond with the words tigers. And that's what we used as a, as a stage curtain. And then the impact resistant lights were installed in the wood ceiling and large voids were cut out for skylights to penetrate. We further fine tuned the acoustics by perforating some of the wood panels. The end result was this transformation of an unused courtyard into a dynamic space, which is now actually used for a fourth function, a new commons area for the entire school. So the next project is Reed Spring. It's a small town in southern Missouri with a population of 873. It is adjacent to the popular tourist destination of Branson where there's a wide collection of entertainment theaters. This area in southwest Missouri was the inspiration for the Beverly Hillbillies and is known is not known for design excellence but rather known for its hillbilly ingenuity with the ordinary. As a result of our collaborative master planning process with the school, the district decided to purchase 150 acres of undeveloped land that separated their high school on the south from three elementary schools to the north. The master plan identified the relocation of the middle school to this new land to unify their campus on one continuous piece of property. Now Reed Spring is located in beautiful Ozark Mountains near Table Rock Lake and um, the area is heavily wooded and steeply sloped. The school district challenged us with preserving the natural beauty of the site, which led to positioning the building at the edge of the woods and then lightly nestled into one of the hillsides. The design solution centered around four common elements found in the Ozark landscape, the shed, the stream, the bluff, and the cave. Now the retaining wall acts as the bluff, a continuous datum through the building that enables construction into the hillside. The two caves or large openings in this wall lead to underground spaces which is the gym and the auditorium. And these spaces double as tornado safe rooms. The stream runs along the retaining wall, which holds a three-story cascading stair and a commons area that is flooded with natural light and is a natural gathering place for social uh, activities. The classroom shed is one of the only visible signs of construction and it houses the collaborative and ever evolving learning spaces. Now, as you approach the school from the highway, the only visible element is a portion of the 400 and, uh, 480 foot long retaining wall. A backlit steel sign on the right reveals the school's mascot and it signifies the main entrance to the school. The offices and the secure entrance are located at the top of this hill in this photo and a glowing red box signifies the emergency stair from the underground gym below over on the left. The lawn between the entrance and this red box is the green roof over these subterranean areas. The classroom wing is one of the only parts of the building you can see from the landscape. It's wrapped in gray and white cement panels in an open joint rain screen system. Now this view that you're seeing in the photograph is the view that you'd see from the woods. Uh, at the bottom of the ravine, the classrooms cantilever past a split face block wall and provides cover for pick up and drop off in bad weather. While the retaining wall juts out into the landscape negotiating the steep terrain around the building. The three-story atrium is the hub of the school and it flows through the center of the building between the retaining wall on the right and the classroom wing on the left and connects all parts of the school. Some of the great things about bluffs in the Ozarks is their texture and their striations and how the light cascades across them throughout the day. And we wanted to capture this experience on the retaining wall. We used varied colors of 
and, and inset location of elongated black, uh, blocks to give this massive wall human scale. A 300 foot continuous skylight along the top allows the sunlight to cascade down the surface of the wall, similar to the way natural light filters through a tree canopy over a stream. And just like this stream would attract wildlife and nature, the natural light along the cascading stair attracts students in the commons area. Now, as students bask in the sunlight to talk and to study, students in the hallways above can connect and interact with their friends below. Now, during the design process, we were worried about the liability of putting crazy middle schoolers in a three-story atrium with only a guardrail protecting the inhabitants below. So a series of vertical wood slats were introduced. And in addition to providing safety along this atrium edge, these wood slats allow daylight to penetrate through the building, similar to the trees in, la in the landscape beyond. At each level, we've introduced flexible and collaborative learning spaces that can be continually modified. The walls in these collaboration spaces are transparent and operable, and they allow the building to be transformed for team teaching and student projects. Marker boards and wireless access points and convenient charging stations are scattered throughout the building and located in several classrooms. The goal for this project was to rethink the design of middle schools and to create a learning building that challenged the way students engage with each other and their environment but to do it in a very simple and cost-effective way. And we were very pleased with how this project turned out. So this next project is located in West Plains, Missouri. West Plains uh, has a population just a little over 12,000 people. Um, but the campus here is, uh, or this project rather, is for a two-year open enrollment campus for Missouri State University. This campus provides an opportunity for higher education to one of the poorest congressional district, districts in the country. Our challenge was to convert an old post office from the 1960s into a new student center from this campus of mostly commuter students. It would include a mix of student services and provide a location for students to gather and connect with each other between classes rather than sitting in their cars on their phones. This diagram was part of our study of how to strengthen campus connections as well as those camp uh, connections back to the community. The campus is located near the New Madrid Fault, which meant upgrading the old post office seismically as well as thermally. And with only $260 a square foot to spend, that meant we had to keep the structure and the skin really light. We're always looking for ways to infuse some level of meaning into our work. In this case, we researched the university's mascot to learn what is it that makes a bear a grizzly. As it turns out, it's the long silvery hairs on the backs of the older bears that give them that name. So we developed a corrugated metal skin with two different profiles that catches the light differently throughout the day as a way to make that connection. We worked with a local fabricator to develop the detailing of these two panels and to study how the visual effect would actually work at full scale. The pattern fades toward the corner entrance with a canopy that reaches out to the campus core and then provides this deep overhang for south and west facing glass as well as defining a porch along its south facade. The building and movement patterns respond to those early diagramming studies. Inside, the student center is anchored by this blue tectum core of enclosed spaces, as well as this series of study niches lined with magenta felt. Even though the space is populated with mostly hand-me-down furniture from the institution's larger uh, parent campus, its scale allows for a wide variety of campus and community events and speakers and social gatherings that just simply was not possible on campus before. Uh, and there are a few moments of a higher level of craft. Here is the transition between the new addition and the original post office space. The glass display cases are used to strengthen campus pride, sometimes dis displaying student artwork, but in this case, uh, a collection of grizzly bears from one of the faculty. Wood is white oak in reference to the town's history as a logging community. So here's the old post office before as we found it, and then essentially the same view after with that strong porch and gesture toward the campus core. This last project is actually located right in the heart of Springfield on the main campus of Missouri State University. We were selected to design a new welcome center for the campus at a prominent site along its eastern edge 
for the primary purpose of recruiting prospective students and strengthening, strengthening the university's connection back to the community. A parking lot site adjacent to the new campus entrance was given to us and we developed a program uh, with the university that was really only about 13,000 square feet. So our strategy was to stretch the program along the street in an effort to strengthen that campus edge and then provide transparency on the north end toward the intersection. We also wanted to develop a movement pattern that would work for guided tours of the campus to begin on axis with an existing bear statue. Visitors enter the building from the west into the lobby and have the ability, uh, the opportunity rather, to explore interactive exhibits in the gallery. Then they move into a 100 seat presentation room, which can also open up to the lobby for larger events or banquets. A tour group then exits the building to the south patio before beginning the campus tour on axis with that bear. And then groups can return uh, back to the building from either the north or the south after that campus tour. The goal was to provide a lot of uh, transparency on the north end of the center toward the intersection, allowing the community to see the activity inside. And the north end expresses this cantilevered stair that provides access to upper level admissions offices. Branding the facility was extremely important to the university, so we made references to its origins as a teacher's college. Uh, so there's this black slate seat wall that sort of extends in through the entry and forms the reception desk on the inside. That's a reference back to the old chalkboards that no longer exist on campus. Likewise, we use the cover of a composition book to develop the perforation pattern used for shading the west facing glass. Then we dog eared the corner as if to tell visitors that they need to come back. Again, we work with a local fabricator to develop the perforation pattern and the approach to the subframing. These full-scale mock-ups also helped us understand the kinds of shadow patterns that we could expect to get. The low relief was used in combination with the perforations so that at times uh, the additional pattern of the relief isn't visible at all depending on the light, but at other times it is. Our hope is to build in surprises that are discovered gradually. Here you can see the effect of that. This new, uh, view looking west toward the gallery or through the gallery uh, with the upper level perforations. And then this view back towards the entry door shows that slate wall and reception desk with a 24 foot tall bear head logo. A suitable uh, backdrop for things like press conferences and of course branding. Uh, also, we developed these pivoting display panels to allow for maximum flexibility of the interior and provide additional screening to the exterior. The stair is located behind the reception desk and gives the entrance that cantilevered covered entrance. The idea was to make the journey upstairs to the admissions office rather dramatic as a sort of celebration of the decision to get a college degree rather than being relegated to some back corridor. Once up on the second level, you get to really experience the dappled light from the screen. A challenge in executing the logo was to figure out a way to get the logo to read from both inside and outside the building. So it's sectioned into strips of steel plate welded to vertical steel angles, and that screens the activity of the intersection from the interior. Chuck Jones was a genius, a super genius, you actually might say. Looney Tunes cartoons were the greatest ever made, in our opinion, because they're so layered with meaning and they work on so many different levels. When Wile E. Coyote blows himself up while chasing the Roadrunner, that is really funny when you're seven years old. But when you're 37 years old and you realize that Elmer Fudd is actually seeing opera with Bugs Bunny, that's funny on an entirely different level. They are both highbrow and lowbrow at the same time, giving viewers renewed appreciation on every visit. Chuck Jones's work is a huge inspiration for us. We want our work to have the depth of a Looney Tunes cartoon. Our practice is truly collaborative making this new norm a challenge for us, but not insurmountable. Our ingenuity will prevail. Thank you to our current and former staff. Our work represents the collective voice of many without whom our practice just simply would not exist. And thank you to the Architectural League of New York and its esteemed jury for this tremendous honor and an opportunity to share our practice with you. We have revered the annual Emerging Voices series and it's recognized firms since the earliest days of our careers. It's been a great ride so far, 
and we are enthusiastically optimistic about what lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you.